Hey guys, Paul Salmon here. Thought I'd throw a few ideas out there that I thought would be uh, things that Robinson should consider modifying about their aircraft. And the interesting thing is I've told people that work, numerous people that work at Robinson, I'm not gonna name any names here, but I've told numerous people that work at Robinson about these ideas. In fact, I told people, hey, just claim the idea is your own. You don't have to tell them I told you, just uh, let's just see if we can make this happen. But so far, none of them really have. Now I will say to Robinson's credit, they did change. I've always wanted adjustable pedals on the left side of the R44. And they finally, uh, you know, they finally did make uh, pedals that are extended. So the, you can buy a set of those and put it on the left side. And that helps a lot for people that are a lot shorter. But uh, had a bunch of other ideas that I thought they might consider modifying uh, their aircraft, parts of their aircraft. So let's get to that. So one of the things I never really liked about the Robinson's checklist, and this is both on the R22, 44, and 66, all three, is the fact that you put your headset on after you've started the aircraft and you've got the, the engine uh, power plant and the blades turning. I never have liked that at all. Uh, I don't think you should be letting go of the stick to put your headset on. Right? So we rewrote our checklist, and our checklist, the first thing you do, and in my opinion, the first two things you should always do in any aircraft is number one, as soon as you get in, put on your seatbelt, and number two, put on your headset. If you want to listen to what's going on outside, you just scoot one ear forward, and you can hear everything that's going on. The next thing we do is turn on the master, all right, which is different from the Robinson checklist. We put on our seatbelt, we put on our headset, we turn the master on. The reason I want the master on is because now you have the intercom and you can talk back and forth to the student. How about you're flying in an R44 Raven 1, you got the doors off of it, you're in a, another airport, and next to you a twin engine has started up and they're doing their run up there and getting ready to move and you can't talk to the student at all. You can't hear each other screaming at each other in the aircraft. Well, if you have your headset on and the intercom's turned on, you can easily talk to each other. And to me, that's a lot better way of doing it than waiting until you've already started the aircraft, you have the engines running, let go of the stick and put on your headset. So that's, that doesn't work for me. We always do it where first thing you do is put on your seatbelt, second thing, put on your headset, third thing, turn on the master. So you'll notice on the checklist that I have redone it, first thing is seatbelts, second thing, headset, third thing, master switch on, okay? Now, if you're the kind of person that doesn't want to change the checklist, that's absolutely fine. But what you ought to do is change your behavior. In other words, when you get in the aircraft, put on your seatbelt, put on your headset, and then run your Robinson checklist. By the time you get down to where it tells you to put your headset on, you already got it on, all right? So you don't have to modify anything other than your behavior. Uh, again, it's a good habit. Put on your seatbelt, put on your headset. As soon as you get in the aircraft. So looking at the stick from the side here, you can see that the stick is angled back quite a ways, all right? And if they were to simply change the stick and make it adjustable, where you could rotate this forward like this, and that's not uncomfortable, an uncomfortable hand position at all, but basically rotating the stick straight down, you would gain the better part of about three inches of clearance here, and uh, that would make all the difference in the world. So, same thing could be done on the pilot side where you Hit a pin you can pull and rotate the stick forward about uh, 20 degrees or so and it would provide a significant increase in the amount of clearance between the back of the stick and somebody's belly if, they're, if they've got a big fat belly. So that's one change that would be, uh, I would think would be quite easy to accomplish. Another thing that I thought Robinson should have done uh, at some point in time was add locks to the seats. So, I mean, you could put a lock in this seat where the, this is the back seat, the rear seats, where you could lock the seats down. You could have locks on the front seat where you could lock the front seats down as well. You could key it the same as the door or the ignition. And, um, you know, the thing about it is if you had uh, all four doors off, one of the concerns has always been in back here, the, when the wind blowing up, this seat could come up and if something's under the seat, it could blow out and go back through the tail rotor. That's why they recommend you really don't take the back, back doors off the aircraft. But if you were able to lock the seats down where you wouldn't have to worry about the seat blowing up like that, any objects could be put under the seat, locked down, and that would eliminate the possibility of something coming out from under that seat and being blown back through the tail rotor. Also, if you're ever at an air show and you're flying a Raven 1, you know, we always take the doors off of them. 
because it's so hot in the summer if you try to fly with the doors on, we take the doors off. Well, if we're in an air show or someplace, we can't really secure our headsets. Uh, you know, somebody could just reach in and pull out your, you know, $1,200 headset or whatever, walk off with it. Well, if we had seat locks on the, on the seat, you could be able to secure all of your belongings, including your headsets, if you were at uh, a public area where the, uh, where, and you had the front doors of the aircraft off. So one of the things that Robson ought to look at is uh, making a kit for a primer. Uh, if you wanted to add a primer to an, a uh, Raven 1 or a R22, anything with a carburetor basically, um, you know, there is no existing kits for you. You have to look through the parts um, catalog, figure out what all parts comprise the uh, primer, order all of that, hope you didn't miss something, and then when it comes in, you get to bolt it all on, put it on the aircraft. If they could simply make up a kit, a primer kit, for the addition of a primer to an aircraft that did not come out with a primer, that would make it a lot simpler and people wouldn't forget, uh, you know, wouldn't order the thing lacking one little piece and not be able to uh, get it together. So I personally think primer, if it has a carburetor on it, it ought to come standard equipment with a primer. It makes them a whole lot easier to start in cold weather. Frequently people that uh, have a Raven 1 that don't have a primer on it and it's in really cold weather, uh, you know, the older ones are 12 volts and it was very easy to, for people to run their battery down or burn up their starter or, or uh, both before they ever got the thing to start. So uh, two thumbs up and a snap to Robinson for going to 24 volts on the Raven 1s. And that pretty much cured most of the starting problems, uh, even in cold weather with the Raven uh, 1 with the 24 volt because it spins the engine so much faster. But the R22 is still a 12 volt. Uh, and uh, you know we've got one without a primer and we're fixing to put a primer on it just because in really cold weather today it's like 10 degrees here today when it's really cold weather it's much easier we have to preheat the engine that sort of thing It'd be a lot easier to start it if we had a primer but uh, like I say I, I wish they would put together a primer kit so you just order it put it on and you're good to go okay guys let me ask you a rhetorical question What's the most dangerous part of your helicopter when it's sitting on the ramp and you're sitting there running, uh, either just started up or uh, cooling the engine down and fixing to shut the aircraft down? What's the most dangerous part of the aircraft that poses the greatest threat to uh, persons on the ground that might be out on the ramp? What would that be? I'm gonna guess it's the tail rotor, all right? You walk into that tail rotor and your, your day is not gonna go well at all, okay? All right, let me ask you another rhetorical question here. What's the only part of your aircraft, when you're sitting in it and you got it running, you're on the controls, cooling the aircraft down or just started up, what's the only part of your aircraft that you really can't see? How about the tail rotor? <laughs> you can't see anything but to the tail. It's the most dangerous section of the aircraft and you have no idea what's going on back there because you can't see it without opening the door, sticking your head way out, and even then it's kind of hard to see, all right? How about we put a rearward facing camera, just like a backup camera. I got a backup camera on all my other vehicles. Why can't I have one on my helicopter, all right? So if you had a rearward looking camera, you could have a little screen on the, on the panel, or you could have it where Bluetooth to a mini iPad, that sort of thing, and you'd have a nice big screen you could look at and see what's going on in the aft section of your helicopter. You know, if you had a passenger with you and somebody was walking up on the ramp and it looked like they're fixing to walk right by the tail rotor, you could have somebody jump out and say, hey, hold your position, you know, and keep them out of the tail rotor. I just think it would be a good idea. Okay, so you guys have seen, uh, these are designed for cars, little 12 volt uh, jumper deals where if you run your battery down, you can hook up and uh, <clears throat> jump start yourself with your basic little kit there. Never seen one that was 24 volts, however. Um, but you know, if you had on your aircraft, you had an auxiliary plug, and that's an option, you can add an auxiliary plug where you can uh, start the aircraft with an APU, an auxiliary power unit. You can make it so that your little jumper actually plugged into the uh, uh, auxiliary power unit uh, plug and you could jump yourself with, uh, they were saying they'd have to design one that was 24 volt, whether those even exist, I have no idea, but it seemed like a good idea. I do know one guy that used to fly a Raven 1 and actually took a 12 volt with him, whether legal, illegal, or otherwise, and because then occasionally in the wintertime, he would actually run the battery down, like I mentioned before, and he would be able to jump himself and get his helicopter going, and uh, so it just seems like it's a, a plausible idea for a 24 volt system, so. I'd get one if they were available. 
Okay, so the difference between a helicopter and an air and an airplane, as far as if you run your battery down and need to jump, most of the time your airplane you're going to be operating off an airport, and you got a lot more resources available to you. A lot of times with helicopters, you're not at an airport. You may be landing at your cousin Jimbo's house or whatever day all night there. Get up the next morning, it's cold. Run your battery down, and now you can't get your aircraft to start. Right? So. I don't think Jimbo's gonna have a 24 volt charger or starter or jumper either. So now you gotta go find a charger someplace, find a cord long enough to get to your helicopter. It's a real pain in the butt. So it would be nice if you had a one of those a 24 volt jump box, so to speak, where you could literally jump yourself and get on your way. So Now the funny thing about this is that every one of these ideas that I've brought up in this video is the potential for Robinson to make money off of it. So you would think that it would be sort of a win-win situation. It'd be nice to have those features available and they could also make every one of those uh, items an issue or a uh, option that uh, they would actually profit from. So to me, that's a win-win, you know, so. All right, well, I hope you found this video at least partially entertaining and uh, it, uh, please, if you haven't already, please like and subscribe and we'll see you guys in the next video.